Every Wednesday between now and December, there will be a lecture on a different topic. And um, the lectures, as you know, are free, but it's very useful for, you, for us if you register for the lectures. And um, I know that most of you have registered for this evening. Um, so please do register for those lectures that you're able to get to. And we hope that you'll become one of our regular customers for these lectures over the next few months. Shortly, I'm going to um, introduce Jarg Pettinger and Mark Quigley, who are going to talk to us tonight about um, the Christchurch earthquakes. Um, but um, as you'll see from the slide, we've got a very exciting series of lectures over the next few weeks. Next week, we have Professor Ewan Mason talking to us about anth anthropogenic um, greenhouse gas emissions and with the question, what if New Zealand is fully greenhouse gas neutral? Just a few housekeeping matters before we get started on what you're really here for. Um, I think we have a slide with the emergency procedures. Yes, thank you. Um, the emergency exits in the building are located at this and this end. I feel like an air hostess all of a sudden. And the emergency lighting will not light up along the uh, aisle. Um, so the emergency exits are at either end. The toilets are up on this level here if anybody feels the need during the evening. Um, and the area, um, surely we won't need to go to lecture on earthquakes, um, is the car park that I think most of you parked in back down on Clyde Road. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you um, Professor Yarg Pettinger and Dr Mark Whitley. Um, Yarg is currently the acting deputy vice-chancellor at the university having been um, promoted upwards on for Conman from his usual role as the head of the Department of Geological Sciences, which he's occupied for the last few roles, few years. Jan is a um, tectonic geologist, and um, over the last nearly 40 years, it's hard to believe, he looks so young, over the last nearly 40 years, Jan's research has concentrated on the New Zealand Plate Boundary Zone, and especially on active tectonic development and earthquake-related hazards in the Canterbury region. We really have got the expert on this matter with us tonight. He's very closely involved in the um, Natural Hazards Research Platform, which is a consortium of research organisations in New Zealand um, working very closely together on natural hazards in New Zealand, the other major partners being GNS and NIWA. Mark Quigley is um, a senior lecturer in the Active Tectonics and Geomorphology Group at the University of Canterbury, again in the Department of Geological Sciences. Mark currently supervises 14 postgraduate students working on anything from tectonically active faults in New Zealand, Garfield, to coral records of climate change in East Timor. So he has a very wide range of interests. Mark has been very closely involved in public communication around the Christchurch earthquakes, and I'm, I'm sure that um, most of you are aware of that. And as a result of that work, was the recipient of the 2011 Prime Minister's Prize for Science Communication and the 2011 New, Ze New Zealand Association of Scientists Science Communication Prize. He's delivered over 50 lectures on the Christchurch earthquakes since September 2010, and has published, already published 10 articles on the um, Christchurch earthquakes. Now, they're both geologists, and they've both become media stars over the last um, year and a half, so it's tempting to refer to them as rock stars. I, thought, I couldn't avoid that, I'm sorry. <laughs> and as I was contemplating this introduction this evening, I couldn't resist trying to work out who they were. So I introduced to you the rock star um, Mick Jagger, the Mick Jagger of tectonic geomorphology. <laughs> I can't believe you guys laughed at that rock star gig. That thing's so old. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much to and welcome to this very long and very narrow lecture theater. Um, can you hear me all right in the back? Yeah, this is un this is unmuted. Hello? They can't hear me. How's this working? Not, it's not working either. 
Hello? Yes. Yep. Okay, that's better. Yep, thank you. Welcome. Um, welcome to our lecture. Um, whoop. Let me pull up the lecture. So this, this question, um, what if we can predict earthquakes? This is not a new question, of course. This is a question that's been around for many, many centuries, in fact. And um, I think it's a great start to this what if series, but because uh, there's no real clear answer and, and it's, a very, it's very polarized. And I'll give you some example of the answer to the polarization to this question with, some, um, with a few slides. And I want to start with this one. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Richter scale, and he of the Richter scale, uh, Charles Richter, who was a professor at seismology, is quite famous for his uh, lavish quotes to the media, but one of them was, only fools, charlatans, and liars predict earthquakes. And then there's a very respected uh, seismologist, Tom Jordan, who is the, the, currently the director of SCEC, the Southern California Earthquake Center. I can tell you scientists who will bet good money that no one will, be, will ever be able to predict earthquakes, but I'm not one of them. So there you go. So one, one, now that we've started with that, I mean, I'd be quite curious before the lecture, and I don't know if this will change, but could I get a show of hands who think that if you all chipped in and provided Yarg and I with um, funding for, infinite funding for um, the next 15 years, and all of our colleagues, of course, whether we could predict earthquakes in 15 years. Could I see a show of hands? How many people think that that might be possible? <laughs> okay, so for you guys in the front, so you don't have to turn around and look back, uh, we're about, I'd say 5%. You're about 5% or so. Okay. Which is interesting. So they asked the same question at um, the United States Geological Survey, one of the hotbeds of earthquake research. And, uh, this was the answer. About 50% of scientists at the USGS thought that that might be possible. That earthquake prediction might be possible. So um, there you go. These are real scientists. You've seen polarizing views, and you've seen the scientific community. At some, in some ways, is split right down the middle. And you can go to conferences now as an earth scientist, and you can go to talks on earthquake prediction and all the rest of it. But the question is, what is earthquake prediction? Um, and we'll get to that. Uh, I think. One thing that we can all agree on, everyone here uh, can all agree upon, is that uh, if we are getting better at predicting earthquakes, it's not showing up. And the reason I say that is if you look at this top graph here, which shows uh, several of the larger earthquakes since 2008, you can see that we have lost lots and lots and lots of lives to earthquakes, the effects of earthquakes. Um, not, and we obviously show up on that list as well. well in the bottom graph there, uh, to try and normalize that data, um, the, the black bars show the earthquake deaths per million. So if we normalize per million people, how many people have died in decade-long bins in terms of earthquakes. And you can see that 2007 stacks up pretty well with the 1970 to 1980 decade. Um, that we that we have lost more people per million to earthquakes in the past and century, but there have also been times where we have lost significantly fewer people, fewer lives to earthquakes. So uh, if we can predict earthquakes, we're not doing a very good job at getting that message out. Obviously, let's let's start with this because we tend to bandy this term around quite a bit, don't we? What is earthquake? We can predict earthquakes. So and so predicted this earthquake. Etc. But what is it? A, a successful earthquake prediction. We need to specify a specific time interval during which the earthquake will occur. So when we talk about short-term earthquake prediction, we're talking about hours to months. So there will be an earthquake in 24 hours, for instance, would be a successful in terms of time scale earthquake prediction. But there are various scales, and Europe will talk more to that. We need to specify the area, of course. Obviously, if we say that there's an earthquake in Christchurch, and everybody leaves Christchurch and goes to Hanmer Springs, and there's an earthquake in Hanmer Springs, then we've actually done worse than better in terms of uh, our, of our vulnerability to those earthquakes. 
Uh, we need to specify a depth range because obviously the further the earthquake away from us is from us, uh, the more attenuation will occur from the source to us. And so if the earthquake was going to be, say, at 150 kilometers depth, uh, it's a very different scenario than if it's going to be at five kilometers de depth. And we can all speak to that quite well. We're, a lot of us are experts in that having lived through this sequence. We need to specify a range of magnitude from which that earthquake uh, is expected to fall. So the airplane evacuating Christchurch, for instance, if we're going to have yet another magnitude for earthquake, because we've all experienced hundreds of those, and we can experience one more. But if we would like to know, certainly, if there was going to be magnitude 7, wouldn't we? We'd probably um, cancel our weekend plans and go somewhere, somewhere else. And very importantly, and something that often doesn't get talked about too frequently, is the probability that that earthquake will fall within all of these intervals is measured by past successes and failures of that predictive method. So uh, I've specified all those things, but my method only works 20% of the time. Um, so kind of, it's up to you whether you, you have how you want to act on that. Unless all these requirements are met, we're not talking about earthquake prediction. We're talking about something else. The prediction cannot be tested against the occurrence or non-occurrence of the event, i.e. false alarms, etc., and therefore the prediction is valueless. So now that I've got through a little bit of the boring ring posts around what we're, our talk is about, I'm going to show you something here. Now, before you read all this, or before I read this to you, please note that this is a fictional statement. So you guys taking photos and stuff over there, I just made this up. But this is what I would say constitutes uh, a useful earthquake prediction. So I'll read that out to you. So increased radon flux, changes in crustal fluid compositions, and increases in seismicity rate on the Canterbury Fault. That's a fictional fault. I just made that up. It's not a very creative name, but I just made that up. Suggest that there is an 80% chance of a magnitude 7 to 7.2 earthquake occurring on this fault in the uppermost 10 to 15 kilometers of crust in the next 72 hours. Residents living within 80 kilometers of this fault are advised to avoid uh, unreinforced masonry buildings and to take caution around all infrastructure and natural environments that could pose a risk within this time frame and until further advanced. Strong ground shaking, power cuts, and disruption of services, we know what that's all about, are likely during an earthquake of this magnitude. Okay, it's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, you know, it's the best I can do in, in the, my preparation for the talk. But you can, constantly, you can see how that statement fulfills the criteria that I spoke about earlier. Now, this statement determines is not necessarily a successful, uh, what I would constitute an earthquake prediction. And I'm not going to attribute this, but if you, you know, I, have, I have put the website there. Um, <laughs> the window of the 15th to 25th of February should be potent for all types of tidal action not only king tides, but cyclone development and ground movement. Over the next 10 days, a seven plus earthquake somewhere is very likely. I can, I'll leave that up to you, whether you see value in that or not. But um, anyway, we've got two very contrasting views of what prediction is there. So the question is, if 50% of scientists at the USGS think that we may be able to predict earthquakes, what is it that gives them that confidence? What is it uh, about earthquake prediction that gives us a hope? Or shall we just abandon it like uh, our friend uh, Dr. Richter suggests? There are two ways in which we think we might be able to progress towards a state where we can derive the sort of useful earthquake predictions that I just mentioned. Number one is a complete understanding of the seismic process, including a way of measuring the state of stress, acting on fault zones at seismogenic depths, uh, so in the, crustal, in the crustal region of Canterbury, we'd be thinking of 5 to 15 kilometers below us. The yield strength of the entire fault zone and the physics of the rupture process, including the likely hypocenter, that's where the earthquake starts at depth, and the barriers that would stop the rupture in its tracks, i.e. the rupture would start at the hypocenter. It's, when it starts, it's going to grow this much, but not that much. And it's going to stop here and here. And that rupture area is going to tell us about the ultimate magnitude of that earthquake uh, and so on. And if we understand all, all those attributes, which sounds somewhat complicated, I'm sure, to you, then we may have a hope, a glimmer of hope. And the other approach, which is used uh, a bit more commonly, is if we can completely understand precursory phenomena, i.e. the things that go on 
before the impending earthquake, if we can understand the cursory phenomena, including not only when they occur and what time-space magnitude relationship, but also what time-space magnitude relationship they have with the impending earthquake. So if we know that before every magnitude six earthquake in Christchurch, uh, Joe's well water goes up three degrees, and that happens uh, five hours before that, that's a precursory phenomenon. But of course, it's not a successful prediction unless it happens before every magnitude six and not in other ones. And if we can put some sort of quantitative time frame onto that, obviously. Okay, is this mic working now? Still not. No, I feel a bit stag. I feel a bit stagnant standing in this place, but I'm just going to stay stay doing that. Hey, can I just ask a question? Yep. Can you explain what radon gas is. Um, I'm actually. I've actually got a slide coming up to that in a second. So I will do. So. Now oh, it's taped on. Okay. So um, you know, for a long time there was a lot of hope. Uh, based on the first thing I mentioned here, based on understanding this seismic process, no good. Thank you very much. Okay, we're all good. That we might actually be able to predict earthquakes and earthquakes were perhaps both time and magnitude predictable, which, is, which would be quite an exciting thing. And so, this theory of elastic rebound, some of you may not be able to see this laser pointer in the back there. Um, but I can't quite reach, so um, you'll have to do your best. Uh, the top left figure here shows stress versus time. So this is the stress acting on a fault in the crust. Okay? And with time, the stress as because of the tectonic forces, and we're very privy to this living on a plate boundary, the stress continues to rise on that fault zone in the surrounding area until the stress acting on the fault reaches a critical stage where there's enough stress acting on the fault, it's enough to overcome the frictional strength of that fault and cause it to slip. So this sigma one here, this dot dashed line is what we could call, say, the yield strength of the fault, right? If the fault will never be able to accumulate more stress than that, every time it gets to that level, it's gonna fail an earthquake. And that bit where that line goes vertical on that curve there is called the stress drop. And that's what happens during the earthquake process. Now, why this is such an important little diagram here is that we, get, we actually, as scientists, can measure all of these things. We can, do, uh, we can look at GPS that tells us something about the rate in which stress is accumulating in various parts of the Earth's crust. So we can get some measurements of that. And there are a variety of other ways in which we can do that. And then this picture down here with my um, PhD student, Tim Stahl, standing on a fault zone, we can collect rocks out of fault zones and do experiments on them in the hope that they tell us something about the strength of fault rocks themselves. And um, this is a picture from another PhD student at Canterbury, Carolyn Bolton, showing a machine that we put fault rocks into and squeeze them and shear them and try and learn more about their strength. So that tells us something about the sigma one thing at the top there. And then after an earthquake occurs, I mean, a lot, a lot of us get criticized for being very good at cleaning up the mess, but uh, I actually really quite like that part of my job. Going out and mapping all these faults once they've ruptured through the surface, that tells us something about the stress drop, potentially. So there are ways in which we can do that. And if that process happened, if the rate in which stress accumulated on faults was constant through time, and if the fault's properties stayed the same through time so that they always had that same strength, so they always broke at the same level of stress. And if that stress drop was the same every time that broke, then we could predict earthquakes and that would be a wonderful world to live in. Um, so we would be able to predict both the time and the magnitude of earthquakes. And there are other models, this, I'm still talking about this one on the left, but I'm gonna shift now one to the right. There are other models that say, okay, well, maybe it doesn't quite work like that. Maybe the fault stays at the same level of strength through time, but the earthquake actually has a different stress drop every time. So sometimes we get a magnitude six earthquake, sometimes we get a magnitude seven, or we have a much higher stress drop on the same sort of fault. And so uh, in that case, we wouldn't necessarily be able to predict how much the fault would slip, so we couldn't predict the magnitude, but we could know that if we had a magnitude seven earthquake or we had that amount of stress drop, then we know that it would be this amount of time here 
before we had another earthquake. And then earthquakes could be time predictable, which would also be quite cool because we could say, oh, we're just going to go away for this week. We don't know how big the earthquake's going to be. We actually hope it might be big because that gives us more time until the next one in that world. And then the final one here is, is actually the fault properties change through time. So the faults, never, we're never really quite sure uh, when the earthquake is going to occur, but based on how long it's been since the last one, uh, we know if it always fails back down to a constant stress level, we'll know how big that impending event would be. And in that kind of world, the longer it is between earthquakes, the bigger the impending event. And that's not necessarily a good place to be. Um, but uh, in fact, when we look at um, earthquakes, and, and that, that, that view actually presided for quite a while, but when we look at real earthquakes on real faults, they don't seem to quite follow that exact pattern that we wish that they did. So in 1985, there was something called the Parkfield uh, earthquake experiment run by a consortium of uh, scientists in the, in the US, uh, USGS and uh, various universities there. And what was noticed about the Parkfield earthquake, so there's a little map here in the top right there with the SAF, that's the San Andreas Fault, and this is a blow up map of that map. And what they noticed in Parkfield is if you look at this bit here, where you've got magnitude, and the timing of earthquakes, magnitude six earthquakes on this segment of the Parkfield, uh, the, the um, Parkfield fault here, um, was that earthquakes occurred roughly every 22 years. Magnitude six earthquakes occurred roughly every 22 years. And there's a lot made of this as a repeating earthquake sequence that was potentially predictable. So it was quite exciting for scientists. So they went out and set up tons and tons of instruments and invested a lot of money and effort uh, and good thinking into this. And, and things have definitely been learned. But scientists said uh, after the earthquake in 1966 and after this experiment had been going on for a little while, they said that there was a 95% certainty of an earthquake occurring on this repeating fault between 1985 and 1993 which is pretty good, actually. Location, magnitude, uh, approximate time, probability, reproducibility. It had the, the, the constituents of a predictive, uh, uh, a, 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 an earthquake prediction. But uh, you know, in 1992 came and went, in 93 came and went, in 94 came and went, and went, and all they had were magnitude fours and fives. And of course, we eat those things for breakfast here in Canterbury, don't we? So, that was not the event that they were hoping for. And so in terms of the predictive criteria, uh, this thing did, it was not a successful prediction. Interestingly, the earthquakes that occurred at that time were in a very similar location to the hypocenter of the 1966 earthquake. So it was almost like this fault was trying to have a magnitude six, but wasn't quite able to do so. Uh, so this image here, uh, depth from the top zero going down, and lateral extent along the San Andreas Fault. And it just basically shows a cross-section of the fault. All these little dots here are smaller earthquakes, and the circles are the location of bigger earthquakes and the stars and so on. OK, so the earthquake, uh, the earthquake prediction failed. And in 2004, they got their magnitude 6. So there was quite a, quite a longer time period between them. So it wasn't exactly time predictable in this case. Um, I think why this, what this highlights is why it's, so, why it's so important to understand the seismic process of earthquake generation, that we can't just expect them to keep on schedule, even on potentially well-behaved segments like this one. Um, so this just shows a record of the San Andreas Fall, a part of the San Andreas Fault, And what it shows is the deviation of the strain from the main strain over time. And I guess the only thing I really want to highlight here, what this highlights is, this is a strain that gets accumulated in the rocks surrounding the fault. And sometimes after long periods of strain accumulation, when you think you're going to get a big earthquake, you just get a little one. That's what this little bit highlights here. For those in the back, long bit of time and then just a little earthquake there. But then other times, um, you go a long period of time with a few little ones, and then you get a really big one. OK, so it highlights some of the issues. They don't necessarily behave the way we wish they would. Now, there is some debate, and you probably read about it in the papers in a few days even. There's some, data about, there's some debate about how the Alpine fault behaves. Does it behave in a systematic sort of way? Does it rupture every 300 or every 500 years, actually, in magnitude 8 earthquakes? 
Um, but I think that requires additional study. Okay, a little bit about, um, before I pass it over to a little bit about earthquake precursors because everybody uh, is quite excited about earthquake precur precursors in some way, shape, or form. So, um, we'll get a scientific consensus, okay? So here's this, a paper published in 2001. Accelerating seismicity, i.e. more earthquakes, and stress release before large earthquakes. That would be good. So you have your seismometers out there. You notice that there's more earthquakes, more stress release prior to a big one. Um, 1987 precursory seismic quiescence. Okay, so maybe maybe we get a more quiescence before a big earthquake. I know a lot of people here actually believe in that, don't you? Don't you? You say, "Geez, it's been you know two months since we've had one. We're really due for a big one, right?" So you might be in this camp with these guys. I don't know. Uh, and then there's um, the the radon. So radon is this gas that gets liberated uh, from rock fracture at depth and. Uh, may come out through fault zones, may be able to be detected uh, on the surface and uh, out of soils and things as well. So groundwater radon anomaly before the Kobe earthquake in Japan, radon was observed to increase. So perhaps if we instrumented fault zones and surrounding areas uh, and measured radon, we might be able to learn something from this. Uh, or perhaps we would notice a decrease in radon around um, around fault zones or in soils surrounding fault zones prior to earthquake. Um, or perhaps we would notice a drop in the mean magnitude of earthquakes. So the, the earthquakes would actually get smaller in terms of the mean prior to a large earthquake. Or perhaps uh, they might actually increase in mean magnitude before earthquakes. So that's kind of the state of the art in terms of where we are with uh, precursors, unfortunately. However, there has been a successful earthquake prediction. In 1975, the Chinese officials ordered the evacuation of Haicheng, a few days prior to the magnitude 7.3 earthquake. And when you go on the internet, you can find that this was uh, the only really truly successful earthquake prediction. There may be others, but this was a successful one. The reasons were that the land uh, changes in land elevation, groundwater tables were noted for months prior to the earthquake. Animals started acting weird. I'm sure lots of your pets acted weird as well. Um, and most importantly, that there was a regional increase in seismicity, which was later recognized as foreshocks. The place was evacuated. A few days later, there was an earthquake. And uh, there were deaths, sure, and injuries. But uh, this was a su successful prediction in the sense that the potential death toll was estimated to me have been way more. And at that time, we were feeling quite, quite, quite good about things, I suspect. Um, but unfortunately, uh, this was followed by a seismic catastrophe. So in 1976, also in China, an earthquake struck without warning. So without any of those precursors, 250,000 fatalities and 164,000 injuries estimated. We never really quite know what those numbers are. Um, and a, a US group visited and visited the labs and looked at the, look at the precursory phenomena and sort of suggest, OK, well, uh, that high chain prediction was based on accelerated seismicity prior to the earthquake. But obviously, that doesn't always happen. So uh, that's the issue there. Uh, just in case you were wondering, uh, this shows uh, a year prior to our, our September 4th event, which kicked everything off uh, over quite a large area. And you can see that there, there was no really systematic increase in, in the earthquake rate or the magnitude throughout that year. And if we look back in time, there's not much of a pattern there as well. So I'm just going to pass over to my buddy Yarg here to take it over for prediction and forecasting. There you go. Thanks, Mark. Can you hear me? Can you hear that? Pretty marginal. I think I'll use the mic. Oh, you need that too. Yeah, I will need a pointer. <laughs> All right, so uh, multitasking, trying to hold a microphone and point at the floor and talk. Um, that's probably destined not to be very good. I've solved the prediction issue. Um, on the 4th of January, we had, a, um, we had a briefing for decision makers, and uh, it was well attended by the media. It was in the dome in Hagley Park, and um, after Kelvin Berryman spoke, I was asked to say some words. And I did, and as usual, I was programmed to give quite a long pitch. And uh, partway into it, I used the number, and I'm not going to say it, but that one. And as I said it, 
there was a magnitude 5 earthquake. Um, <clears throat> I didn't feel it. I had no idea what people were looking consternated about. Uh, some people were heading for the door and I was trying to talk and concentrate. It didn't work. Um, anyway, I found out what the issue was, of course. So what I'll undertake to do tonight is not to use the next three numbers in that sequence. All right, so um, Mark has, has kind of delivered us at the point where we can talk a little bit more about prediction and what I want to do is, is take you then into what we've been experiencing in Canterbury and talk a little bit about some of the research findings and some of the work that we've been doing over the last few decades and then progressively come back to what we are researching at the present time. There is sort of an underlying theme which I'll try to capture as I go through. Um, but first of all, let's just talk a little bit about the different types of earthquake prediction. And so in the top bullet, earthquake prediction is deterministic. In other words, it's quite definitive. You're actually giving quite precise information about the location and the size of the event in a way that it could be used effectively by the community in order to safeguard itself from the effects of the earthquake, the impacts of the earthquake. And Mark has already alluded to that with his case studies. Um, the second bullet point, uh, and I should say, just finishing off that statement there, so it's a target event which occurs within a space and time domain, and it has to be realistic, it has to be constrained in that sense if it's going to be a really effective prediction. The second bullet point is, is uh, an earthquake forecast which talks about the probability that you will get a target earthquake event within a space-time domain. So here we might be talking about the likelihood that you're going to have, the probability that you're going to have, say, a magnitude 6 event, and there's a 10% chance of that in the next 50 years. Or, in other words, there's a very good chance that it'll happen sometime in the next 500 years, or 475 if you do the calculations. So those are the, the distinctions. Um, one is deterministic. It's, it's an event which you can respond to and you can anticipate uh, will have a fairly high degree of reliability about it. The second one is much, it has a much longer term perspective to it, but it may be useful to us if you think about designing buildings, land use zoning, and so on. But it, the bottom one, the second one, wouldn't be much help in terms of, uh, you know, how are we going to approach coming to this um, venue tonight and, um, and how are we going to respond because you're not going to sit there waiting for it for 10 years. Okay, so uh, probabilistic forecasting of earthquakes. First of all, the short-term forecasting, and we're really now talking about things that we might anticipate over hours and days, maybe extending out to weeks. Um, you have to make use of aftershock models. And uh, as we'll do in a minute, we'll have a look at a very good aftershock sequence that we can use for that. Of course, the sequence that we're living through at the present time. Uh, the second point is that medium and long-term forecasting uh, is based more on geological data. So that's the field work that we can contribute, especially the study of the faults in a region that are active. The GPS data, the global positioning data, that tells us about how the crust is straining and distorting and how the stresses are building up. And uh, thirdly, looking at the regional seismicity, the earthquake activity that's occurring in a region and how that might inform uh, a sort of forecasting approach. Now, if you don't have an aftershock sequence, then you've got to resort to that longer-term view ab about forecasting. And this is about constructing a seismic hazard model for a region, and so I want to talk a little bit about that in a minute. And it requires the input of geological information, so field data again becomes crucial. Now, the, the diagram on the uh, right-hand side here it's just a hypothetical diagram, probably a little bit difficult to, to see all the details in it, but you, first of all, it's just a cube of the crust. It doesn't matter what the dimensions are, but you could think of this as being, say, all of the Canterbury Plains area. So this is the, the land surface through here, and this is down to some depth beneath the ground surface. Let's say 15 kilometres, because that's the seismogenic, the earthquake-rich crust that we, we're currently getting a lot of our aftershocks out of. Now we get, um, during times when we don't have large earthquakes going on, we get distributed earthquakes throughout this region, throughout this volume of rock. 
And so the black dots on the surface just represent the distribution of these earthquakes. That's the aftershocks, sorry, that's the seismicity that we refer to up in the first bullet. Secondly, there are earthquake source structures. Those are fault lines capable of generating large earthquakes. So here's one sitting in here, this light yellow fault. You can see it's a bit segmented. That's the, the red line is where it intersects the ground surface. And we can identify that as a potential source for, for generating earthquakes. So we have to take that into account. If it breaks the ground surface, then we can do our geological investigations on it. What do we want to know? We want to know how large a magnitude earthquake might it generate, when did it last generate a large earthquake, and how frequently does it generate large earthquakes. Then we're in the game. We can actually really assess um, our future seismic activity much more realistically. There's also a, another surface in here, this slightly darker um, yellowish surface. That's a fault that's hidden beneath the surface. It doesn't have a surface expression necessarily. That's a hidden structure, and we need to be able to somehow quantify them as well. So that's the starting point. So if we're going to approach long-term, medium-term forecasting of earthquakes, probability forecasting, we need both the seismological data, the earthquake activity in a region, and the geological data. OK, now let's move on to, first of all, looking at the seismicity of the Canterbury region, and we can take this aftershock sequence. I'm not going to spend too long on this because I'm sure you've all seen these images. Um, they are uh, produced every month by GNS Science. So this one is quite recent, just a couple of weeks ago, and it shows the sequence of earthquakes, large, uh, the main shocks and the aftershocks, the larger aftershocks, um, from the time of the 4th of September through to pretty much the present day. So the green uh, dots here represent the aftershocks relating to that first period from September the 4th, 2010 through to February 2011. The red uh, dots represent the location of the aftershocks um, relating to the February, uh, 22nd of February earthquake. The blue ones for the June uh, aftershock sequence and the pink ones, which might be a bit harder to see offshore, especially out here in Pegasus Bay, represent those aftershocks relating to the large events in December last year. So first of all, you can see that the, there's a, a pattern here that is a migration of seismicity from, broadly speaking, from west to east. And it's now significantly, most of it has moved offshore. So we'll come back and talk a little bit about that. You'll see also that there isn't a lot of sort of referred seismicity continuing west of the aftershock sequence post-December. There's a few earthquake events out here near Rolleston. That's been a rich area of aftershock activity. That's around the termination of the Greendale Fault. But generally speaking, the seismicity has migrated through and the levels of aftershock activity have been decaying away progressively um, in the areas to the west. OK, now uh, this is a slightly different view of what's going on in the crust beneath the Canterbury Plains. Uh, this is an image produced by Elliot and others uh, just recently. And um, the top of this block diagram, so just, just looking at the surface, the top surface of this block diagram like that, that's the ground surface. And we're looking at a three-dimensional perspective sort of into the upper crust. And what we see here are um, a whole complex array of faults extending to depths of about 15 kilometers beneath the surface. So if we first of all take the group of faults off to the top left of the diagram, they are the various fault segments that ruptured in September 2010. There are um, a total of, and you can see the number in there, I won't say it. Um, and the color coding here just represents the amount of movement that happened on the fault plane. So it's a complicated array of faults that has ruptured. They've interacted. Rupture actually started on this Charing Cross segment here, then propagated onto the Greendale Fault proper, and finished off with ruptures of other secondary faults. 
Uh, in the lower foreground here, we've also got the uh, events relating to the Port Hills Fault and more recent activity on the structures beneath the city. So this aftershock sequence and the main earthquakes allow us to get a very good understanding of where these faults are located in the, su in the subsurface, even though we can't get down there to actually see them. So one of the problems we've got is we've got hundreds of metres of gravels covering these faults, so we don't have visibility to them. Yet we need to know where they are, we need to know their extent, their geometric extent, and ideally we'd like to know how frequently these faults are active and what size earthquakes they can generate. So we wouldn't like to have to go through what we've just gone through to find all the faults beneath the Canterbury Plains. That's one of the problems. This particular sequence has given us much more information that we had prior to the, tenth, the 4th of September. Can you hear me OK? This thing seems to be a bit, a bit dodgy. Is it all right at the back? OK. All right, now we can learn a lot from the aftershock sequence, coming back to thinking about forecasting based on uh, short-term projections. The idea is that um, once you have a large earthquake, you'll have a lot of aftershocks which then decays away exponentially over a period of days, weeks and months and extending out over years. So that's more or less what this little graph in the bottom lower left is showing. Um, if we think about how many earthquakes we've actually had, well, over 10,000, well and truly over 10,000, that includes all the small earthquakes. But of course we've had one magnitude 7, three in the 6 to 6.9 range, 55 in the 5 to 5.9 range, over 400, 4 to 4.9, and well over 3,000 now in the 3 to 3.9 range. Now, a lot of those have happened relatively closely clustered together immediately after each of the big earthquakes. But um, the reality is that we're, uh, you know, experiencing this ongoing activity which will extend out for weeks, months, and years from now as that earthquake activity gradually subsides. Another way of uh, presenting sort of derived information from these aftershocks is to look at the short-term um, forecast for earthquake activity. This is taken from GeoNet, and um, I've preserved in my computer files somewhere the July last year, July the 6th um, plot, and down here is the probability bar, and it goes from the, the hot colours, sort of one in 10 chance in the next 24 hours, through to the cooler colours, which are getting right out towards sort of more than 100, that one in 100,000 probability. But you can see that pretty much a bullseye on Christchurch and surrounding area. We had elevated probabilities in July last year. That was obviously immediately after we'd had the June activity. Now, um, coming through to the right-hand diagram here, the 24-hour aftershock forecast map for June uh, the 23rd, so this is uh, pretty much over the weekend, you can see that the levels of um, likely, um, prob the probability of damaging earthquakes is much reduced. If we extended this to the offshore area, we would probably see some of this, this green coloration still sitting out offshore here. But you'll notice that the levels of activity now for the Canterbury Plains area have sort of equilibrated to the levels that we would expect to see in the Southern Alps. So that overall, the probability of aftershocks is starting to fade towards the background levels. They're still significantly higher than they were before the earthquake sequence started. That's the level of activity covered by this darker blue colour. And you might be able to see this sort of bright patch here near Ashburton. If you think back about a month ago, we had a magnitude, was it about 5.4, at a depth of about 30 kilometres. This is the elevated level of aftershock activity just relating to that one event. And that will subside over the coming weeks and months as well. So that's short term, hours to months forecasting. Here's another way of looking at it. This is a table split into two parts um, with magnitude down here, so 5 to 5.4, 5.5 to 5.9 and so on. 
short term on the left side, medium term on the right side. So let's look at the short term first of all, the probabilities. If you go to a 5 to 5.4 event, over the month from the 28th of May to the 27th of June 2012, there's a 17% or about a 1 in uh, 5 chance of an earthquake of 5 to 5.4 somewhere in the Canterbury aftershock area. That's the statistical der derivation looking at the activity we've been having. If we start to look at, say, 5.5 to 5.9, you can see it's down to a 1 in 20 chance of one of those in this month period. Now, if we take those same two um, magnitude ranges and look on the right-hand side of this table, you'll see that we're expecting somewhere between 0 and 4 of those events. There's a 75% probability over the next year. So there's still quite a high probability that we'll have an earthquake of that size doesn't mean to say it's going to be right beside under the city. It could be offshore to the east, but it could also be out towards Oxford. So it's somewhere in that aftershock region. And you can see the probabilities of these higher magnitude events gradually dropping away. So if you take the 6 to 6.4 magnitude, there's a 10% probability of that happening in the next, um, next year. Another way of saying that is there is a 9 in, ten, in 9 in 10 chance it won't happen. It's another way of looking at those numbers. Okay, and um, just looking at this next plot, uh, we have the cumulative number of aftershocks up on the left-hand side here. Um, the graph across the bottom is dates, time. So right over on the left-hand side, we've got a star, and that's the 4th of September, magnitude 7.1 earthquake. With it, we would anticipate, if that was the only earthquake we'd had, a sequence of aftershocks that would more or less follow this blue line here. That's the average aftershock model, extending through to about um, January this year. Um, there's uncertainty there, of course. That's not a definitive number. Um, so there's... The likelihood is the 95% confidence is that the earthquake aftershocks, the number of earthquake aftershocks, will fall between the upper and the lower grey line running through here. Now, the reality is that the number of aftershocks that we experienced actually follows the red line that you see running from the left side to the right side of this diagram. And with each of the stars, so there's the 4th of September, 22nd of February, June and December um, last, uh, last year. Um, what you can see here is that we had a significant deficit in aftershock activity right through to about where we start at 2012, where the aftershock activity now sits pretty well within the anticipated total aftershock activity following the 7.1 earthquake. So you could sort of argue that we may be moving into territory here where the aftershocks are starting to track towards what we would expect normally if we just had one large earthquake and then just a decay of aftershocks afterwards. The reality is that our aftershock sequence started off low and has been re-energized repeatedly by moderate size magnitude 6, 5.8 events. And progressively we're playing catch up here. So. What's the reason for that? Well, we're working on it, but obviously the complexity of the geologic structure has a lot to do with that. Okay, I'm going to go on to some field photos in a minute, but the last graph is, is actually just to give you some idea of how complicated this game gets when you're trying to design buildings and come up with land use zoning criteria. So up on the left-hand side here, we've got a, a sort of an index called the shaking hazard. Engineers refer to it as the Z factor. This is a multiplier that relates to the earthquake activity in a region. Let's just leave it at that. Um, prior, and then down here we have years along the bottom of the graph, years before, um, years from June 2011, I should say. So it's uh, right over on the left-hand side here. Um, that's uh, <coughs> June, the, June 2011, and then 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years on. Now. Prior to the 4th of September, 
the Z factor sat for Christchurch at 0.2, which was based on the aftershocks prior to the 10th of December. Mark showed that plot before. So that's the green line we see running across the diagram here. Immediately uh, after the earthquake sequence, the Z factor, of course, has gone up. We've got a lot more earthquake activity going on, a lot of aftershocks. And the blue plot shows you approximately the track of aftershock activity um, generating a Z factor over a period of time. So actually the Z factor is going to decay away from a high of about 0.5 and it will decay away over the next few decades to what will be probably around about 0 0.3. So that's significantly higher than it was before the 4th of September and it'll stay there for quite some time. The 50-year average, if you take into account the high activity sort of that we're in at the present time and over the previous year, and then the anticipated lower activity as we move decades from now, would give us a 50-year average of about point, uh, point 0.34. So that's this um, dashed black line running across here. So the difficulty when it comes to making decisions around di design criteria and so on is which, which number do you, do you use? Do you go back to the pre-September? Do you take a very conservative view up here? Do you shoot for the 50-year average? Or do you work to what you think will happen by the time you get to about 2030? Those are some quite significant questions that have to be addressed. Um, I think in the end we've, we've opted for uh, this 50-year average which is conservative on the one hand and probably um, pragmatic in terms of where we are at the present time as it's tracking towards that average. This is using the aftershock sequence for what I've referred to here of short to long-term forecasting. Okay, so it's not prediction, it's just giving us levels of activity that we should be designing and planning to. Wellington, by the way, sits... Um, where is it? Wellington is 0.4, so it sits, sits up here at that, level, at that level there. All right, so um, going on now to have a look at earthquake source structures, looking at these faults. So we've talked a bit about how seismicity can be used. What we want to do now is, is think about how geologists might contribute to the forecasting game. And the first thing that always comes up when you're thinking about faults is where are they? Well, if they are exposed at the surface, if they have outcrop, it's easy. If they're buried beneath several hundred metres of gravel beneath the Canterbury Plains, it's not such a straightforward business. When did they last rupture? And when will they rupture again? Challenging questions. How often will they rupture? What's the regularity? Mark's already hinted at the variability that we tend to see. And how large an earthquake will it be? From these uh, sort of field studies, we can come up with some estimate of the maximum magnitude earthquake that we could experience. And prior to September the 4th, in the probability analysis that we had done uh, in conjunction with uh, the team at GNS Science, we'd contributed our regional data into that modelling, we came up with a maximum magnitude earthquake somewhere beneath the Canterbury Plains of magnitude 7. So to some extent, I think if you think about long-term probability forecasting, we pretty much nailed it, actually. The bit we, didn't, we weren't able to tell was where. That was the, the, the issue, really. There's a second thing that we can come up with some information on is the amount of ground surface displacement. So the, the, the surface rupturing that we saw um, on the Greendale Fault is, is a good ex, ex, uh, example of that. And lastly, we would like to know something about the probability of exceeding Ground motions, accelerations, those are the things that really ultimately damage uh, the structures that we live in. All right, so this is a diagram which um, I think will come out any day in the Royal Commission report. It captures uh, just our part of the Canterbury Plains. It shows you uh, on the Canterbury Plains immediately west from Christchurch, of course, the Greendale Fault. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to use the pointer here. For those of you that sit at the back, it'll be a bit difficult. But there's the Greendale Fault running uh, east-west across the plains and the various branches that are associated with that rupture. Um, and then the various faults that have ruptured and have had seismicity associated with them 
uh, immediately next to Christchurch City and extending offshore. Sitting between Hallswell and Lincoln, we've got some other structures plotted in here. Those are based on some seismicity data. We had a very busy spell of seismicity in this area last year, and we've done some seismic reflection surveys to um, get a better understanding of the location of those structures, as well as some faults beneath the city. Now that's all related to the recent activity, just stuff that we've acquired um, after the earthquake sequence started. If you now look towards the top um, left of this map, and it's a geological map that underlies the, uh, the diagram here, all these red lines represent active faults capable of generating large earthquakes. And uh, there's quite a pattern of them. You'll see, for example, from just north of Rangiora, um, in an east-west orientation is the Ashley Fault System, wraps around the Meraki Downs and near Cust here, and then heads off towards Oxford. Um, that's a very similar style structure to the Greendale Fault, just immediately west of us. And I think structurally it's identical in terms of its origins, and I'll talk a little bit about its origins in a minute. If you look further to the west, the northwest, then we start to see faults which are more in, an e in a northeast-southwest orientation. These are the younger faults that are starting to uh, allow the Southern Alp foothills to uh, rise and become elevated. And these fault lines rupture with reasonable regularity. The Portis Pass Fault has ruptured five times in the last 10,000 years, just as an example. We also know that there are active faults offshore in Pegasus Bay, and there are some structures I'm going to talk about, in particular the Springbank Fault here in a minute. Okay, now, um, just conscious of time, Mark, I'll just, I guess I'm going too slow. Um, so here we have stress diagram. Now stress is a, quite an interesting concept for us to try and explain to an audience. The first thing is it's pressure. It, it's, it's a form of pressure. And if you go to the bottom of a swimming pool or if you dive into the ocean and go down to the seafloor, you experience pressure. You experience pressure from all directions and it's equal. That's just the water pressure. It's the weight of the water above you. If you're a bit of rock sitting in the field, you feel that pressure of overburden of rock, the same as you would if you jumped down into the bottom of the swimming pool. But you also experience a directional pressure which is to do with the way the plate motion is driving the regional stress field. So there are two components. There's the overburden of rock and there's the direction, the tectonic direction of stress. And um, faults can accommodate or accumulate that stress, that, that pressure, up to the point where the strength of the fault is overcome by the stress that's acting on it. So that's when it ruptures. So stresses cycle, just as Mark showed before. So these diagrams, um, the left-hand top diagram here, uh, just shows you a fault line in white running across the diagram. And there's a fence, and we've got the bottom half of this diagram moving to the left and the top half moving to the right. And if you look carefully, you'll see the grid, including this fence line, is being distorted. Now, you'll never go out in the field and see this, but it's very subtle and it's happening. But at some point, this elastic stretching, if you like, and distortion cannot be accommodated any further, and this, uh, some patch on the fault will rupture. That's the moment an earthquake happens. That's the moment a displacement happens. And so you get a displacement which offsets the fence line, in this case, this orange line that runs right up here, up to the fault, and steps over to the right, and then carries on. But the fault only ruptured from the tip over here to the tip over there, so the white section. And the stresses around the fault have now changed. The stresses that have been distributed evenly throughout the rock mass around the fault have been distorted. Some of it on the fault has been relieved. And we show this as a stress drop. That's the blue color. Whereas at the tip of the fault, the stresses are concentrated. The distortions are concentrated. And this is where we'll get a lot of aftershock activity in these areas of changed and, and increased stress focusing. So that's an increase in stress. So that's some of that background stuff that we tend to 
try to explain and it's quite challenging when we're talking to the newspaper because we don't get enough sound bites to do it. But hopefully that helps to kind of capture that. I think it's important also, just for a moment, while I think about it, so we've got a fault running in this, this diagram here. If you can see the cylinder of rock, we start off with just a straight out cylinder of rock. We put it under pressure, a directional pressure in this case, and then the rock fractures, and it fractures in two shears, which I've shown in red on here. The pressure is still acting, that's the stress is acting like that. So the stress direction doesn't coincide with the faults or the shears directly. So in this case, the stress would be acting sort of oblique to the fault like that. All right, now what can we do with this? Well, we'd like to understand how this fault sequence is operating during earthquakes. So here in this top diagram, we have the Darfield earthquake, September 2010. Uh, the black line here is the Greendale fault rupture. And the rupture, because it was a complicated fault, remember it had a number of segments that, that ruptured, um, we get a very complicated stress field change. This is just a preliminary model that's been done by Sandy Stacy from Ulster University. And the red represents elevated stress, the blue decreased in stress. Notice that one lobe of stress sort of heads out towards Christchurch over here. Here's the coastline, Littleton Harbour. Now, that's just the Darfield event. If we then go to the add the February event, so that's over here in this diagram, notice now how this stress change, the increase in stress and the decrease in stress, has changed dramatically around the city. And what we look at is how do the aftershocks relate to this. We might anticipate, for example, that aftershocks will be concentrated more in the, in the increase in stress areas, the lobes of increased stress. And some of these other crosses here represent where some of the further aftershocks have happened. And finally, if we add the June event, then the pattern is, becomes even more complicated. Now, we haven't got it right yet. This model isn't working properly. The reason it isn't working properly is because we don't have all the subsurface geometry sorted out. There's still more work to do. Why am I talking about this? Because it just highlights how difficult it will be to finally nail the prediction game. You need high quality data. And we've got some of the highest quality data to draw on. Prediction is going to be very, very challenging in, in no matter how you go about it. OK. Um, I'm just conscious that I've still got quite a few slides here, Mark, and uh, probably should wind it up in about five minutes. But um, So for the last 25 years, we've been looking at the earthquake activity in Canterbury. And this diagram, which you can't see on the right-hand side, represents some of the 100 or so earthquake source faults that we have been working on over the last 25 years. And on the left side, we've identified in colour the domains, the areas in which geologic structures behave in a similar sort of manner. So on the west coast side, of course, we have the Alpine Fault in Marlborough, the Marlborough Fault System, uh, various areas of faulting in the, in the foothills in North Canterbury. The one I want to draw your attention to is the grey area here, the Canterbury Plains, which I call Domain 7. This is hidden and unstudied faults. And down the bottom here, of course, the Greendale Fault, previously hidden and unstudied fault, unrecognised fault beneath the Canterbury Plains. It didn't prevent us from coming up with a realistic magnitude estimate for a structure beneath the Canterbury Plains. Um, what information we had from the subsurface beneath the Canterbury Plains was pretty limited and it was mostly related to oil industry surveys that have been done over the previous decade or two. So um, this is a geological map showing the uh, different geologic um, uh, units in Canterbury, so the volcanics of the peninsula, the Canterbury Plains gravels, the grey wackies of the, of the foothills in the Southern Alps. And shown on here are the major fault lines in black and here in South Canterbury, we've got the Rakaia Graben and the Heinz Graben. A Graben is essentially, if you take a, a, a volume of rock and you stretch it in the directions of the arrows, then the block will fracture and it'll be displaced. You get a sort of keystone effect. 
and you get what are called grabens or depressions and Horst's ridges. Those are German terms that are used. So these structures are hidden beneath the Canterbury Plains gravels. This is what they look like. And they relate to the time when New Zealand drifted from Gondwana. So that's sort of 90 to 60 million years ago. And the crust in the Canterbury region was stretched and these faults formed. And subsequently they have been buried by all the sedimentation that's been going on since. Now I'm going to show you some seismic profiles from oil industry across these two structures. And I've got the interpretation sitting on here. So here's the Rakaia Graben in the north. So the Quaternary gravels, five, six hundred metres of gravels sitting up here. That blue line up the top underneath the, the label Quaternary gravels, that's two million years old. Then we go down to the Pliocene Kowai formation, more gravels and deposits of um, uh, associated with, with the formation of the Canterbury Plains, that's about a five million year old surface. And as we go down deeper, we've got the Mount Summers volcanics and the late Cretaceous in here, that's about 60 million years old, that surface through there. And you can see these faults, these Graben faults, a little block diagram to remind ourselves, this is the depression in here, extending up towards the surface on one side of this Graben, but not extending up on the other side. So this fault's been active in the more recent geologic past. In fact, we see some warping at the surface, suggesting that these faults have been active in the last couple of million years. On the south side of this graben, there's no sign of activity. This fault is dead. It hasn't moved, but it's still there, and it could be exploited by plate motions. Um, the Heinz Graben, but further south, same thing. You've got these two faults with other faults in here. But notice that there's only one structure, one of these faults, which is breaking right up towards the surface on the south margin of this, displacing each of these units at depth. So there's some evidence that these faults are being reactivated, but not all of them. Only some are selectively being reactivated. Um, in North Canterbury, the North Canterbury Plains, I'll skip through this fairly quickly, we've got the Ashley Fault System, and here we can see these old Graben structures again buried at depth, the Canterbury Plains gravels up here. Now these faults are being inverted, so these, the structures are actually reversing and starting to thrust up the bedrock um, and exposing it at the surface. So if you know the North Canterbury area around Cust, you've got the Meraki Downs. Some of the older units are being uplifted and exposed at the surface. So these faults in the North Canterbury Plains are much more active than the ones in the South Canterbury Plains. And the Greendale Fault fits that story in between. The top diagram is just another one of the Ashley Fault. Let's not worry about that. Okay, and I mentioned the Springbank Fault before. That's uh, the structure running southwest from Rangiora and between Rangiora and Cust. And um, also we've got the Hororata um, Fault and uh, associated deformation near Hororata, sort of at the western tip of the Greendale Fault. And again, these oil industry lines show us faults which are being reactivated in the subsurface they are starting to take up some of the plate motion strain. And so uh, the Springbank Fault in the, in the lower diagram here has quite a substantial offset and surface expression. And uh, so does the Hororata Fault. So if you're on your way up to um, Springfield and just past Racecourse Hill and you look towards Mount Hutt, which is in the distance there, you'll see this terrace. And it's, it's a, an elevated terrace quaternary gravels, and then all of a sudden it starts to warp, and then it dives down beneath the plains. That's the surface expression of a thrust fault that is active in the subsurface. There's no fault trace here, it's just warped terraces sort of draping over the top. And the Springbank Fault's much the same. This is up near um, Rangiora. So here's the fold with the fault in the subsurface in here accommodating displacements, but just warping the strata in the surface. So this is actually the beginning of a fault breaking out and having surface expression. What it's telling you is that these structures are quite active. They're quite busy. They're starting to sense activity 
associated with the overall plate deformation. So not all of it's hidden beneath the planes, but what is sticking its nose up above the planes is quite subtle. And we've got a model for this. Um, so this is kind of based on, on the mapping of the, the area of the North Canterbury Plains. Basically, if you look on, the, on the, uh, this uh, foreground side of the block diagram, you see these old Cretaceous faults, the extensional faults that we were talking about and the seismic lines. Those are being reactivated with horizontal displacements. So these are the, the arrows that we see here. And then on the left side of the block diagram, you see the thrust faults starting to accommodate the squeezing and shortening of the plate. And that's giving rise to the uh, structures that we see on the west side of the Canterbury Plains and also around the Ashley area. So this is the geological model that explains the tectonic activity that's happening. All right, and we see exactly the same story offshore. We've um, shown this diagram before. This is from Phil Barnes at Niwa. And we've got these east-west faults, which are active, shown in red and, and yellow here, or brown. And um, generally, that activity doesn't extend very far out into Pegasus Bay. If we take one of these faults, uh, sorry, one of these uh, seismic lines in here, and we look at that, so that's the seismic line north-south in the bay. What we see is, again, the same story. This is the Banks Peninsula volcanic horizon running through the middle of this diagram, um, coming out and daylighting on Banks Peninsula at the very left side of the diagram. Deeper down in the subsurface here, um, we see some of these older extensional faults, and just the occasional fault is becoming active, but not all of them. So that's the story beneath the Canterbury Plains and offshore. It makes sense. I'm just going to skip through this pretty quick. So there's the regional tectonic squeezing, the compression, the stress field. That relates to the plate motions. And you can see it's oblique to the Greendale Fault. And overall, this is the sequence of faults that have been triggered or activated by the plate motions. And um, the slip has been transferring across these structures. The reason it's taking a bit of time is because they don't all connect up. They don't all link up. There's a significant gap in here. Um, and there is no fault that will directly accommodate the connection through under the uh, western part of the city. So that's the, the model that we've come up with. The aftershocks actually confirm that. They tend to sit in these shaded areas that we've included there. Okay, the last comment is really to do with the plate motions. Um, we've got the Alpine Fault on the west side of the island, and plate uh, deformation is distributed across about 150 kilometres. Um, so all the southern Alps are really being driven up by active um, faulting. And we can divide that up using GPS data into domains. Uh, this is the work from Laura Wallace and others from GNS Science. And if we just worry about this eastern part of the island here, then we can say that the eastern part of Banks Peninsula is moving on average about two to three millimetres closer per year to Porter's Pass. By implication, the um, displacement on the Greendale Fault has to be accommodated on average about every 1,500 years, plus or minus 250 years, to keep up with that shortening across the area. So while the Greendale Fault may not have ruptured more than once every 10 or 15,000 years, there must be other faults doing the business in between time. So it's, you know, we still are talking thousands plus, thousand plus years, but um, it's not a once in 15,000 year type event. What do we do with all this stuff? What do we kind of finish off with here? Well, the seismic data, the seismological data, the earthquake activity in the region, the geological studies get combined into a probability map which captures in various ways, however you want to play this game, um, the ground accelerations over periods of years. So here we're talking about the probability, the 10% probability of um, peak ground accelerations over a 50-year period. So you can see Christchurch in this 19, uh, 2008 model was somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4 G. Now, what was the downtown G 
in February last year, Some, somewhere around point, point 0.6 to point 0.8, Port Hills was getting up towards 2G at uh, Heathcote Valley. So they were much higher on this um, scale than this particular plot shows. In other words, we had an event which happens every two to 3,000 years, not once every 500 years. So that's, these are the uh, uh, probability maps which, which are used to develop the design codes and they capture the geological data and the seismological data. Um, but um, they, are, they have limitations and you can see straight away what they are. They're not a forecasting, they're not a prediction tool, they're a forecasting tool. Right. That's okay, this is really quick. My parents took me to see Lawrence of Arabia once when I was a kid, and I was reminded of that. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, a couple quick things. At Rapaki, where we've been doing a bit of work, we found these um, massive boulders that have come down in rock falls at some time, and we don't know when. So just like if you went out and sat in the sun, for a couple hours without sunscreen on and came inside and I could tell from the burn on your arm how long you'd been out there. We're trying to do a very similar thing here. We're trying to date these rocks, these paleo rock falls, these past prehistoric rock falls, by the chemistry in their skin. So that's one of the cool things we're doing. And like, the reason I like this picture here is here's a big rock fall that's been sitting there for X number of years, be it 500 or 1,000, and there's a boulder that came down in the February earthquake lying up against it. So obviously it tells us something about the return times. So the models that Yarg was just talking about, the percentages based on other things, based on map faults and seismicity, we all want to know how frequently we get that sort of ground acceleration. These are some of the ways that geologists at UC and other places are looking at trying to solve that problem. Um, simple, simple reasons, obviously, right? These are very simple, common sense sort of things to us now, but of course, um, as geologists flying around in the helicopter after the February earthquake, we were going, wow, look at these tension cracks up here on the edge of cliff faces. And all that material, if it fails, has got to go somewhere. So if we're going to continue the pattern of building big, beautiful houses straight up the, against the edge of cliffs and also on the tops and at the bottom, it's obviously not good practice. And the sort of obs geological observations we make have some bearing on that. So you can see what happened in June. That's the same spot there. That whole cliff fit cliff face failed, so we feel quite good about the observations we made post-February. Um, things like when we know where a fault is, all the stuff that Yarg's been talking about, these active faults throughout Canterbury, once we know where it is, how do we design around it? So how far do we need to set back houses and infrastructure from known fault zones? And by mapping faults like the Greendale Fault in a lot of detail, we can define basically how far we think uh, is a safe building zone around those faults. New houses on good ground performed very well 50 to 100 to 150 meters away from the Greendale Fault rupture trace. But there's not much you can do when the fault goes in your front door and out your back door, no matter how good the house is. So that's why that's quite important. And finally, you might have seen some of the cool stuff in the press. This is a master's student uh, at UC, Sarah Baston, who's digging big holes in my property. We, we didn't have Sarah's permission, so we're going to start making sure we do that. Um, but digging, digging big holes in my property and finding evidence for paleo li liquefaction, which means prehistoric events, we don't know how old they are, we're trying to date them. But this is a big blob of sand that has been injected into the subsurface there um, at some point. And so by working out when that is, we get some idea about the return times of ground shaking required to cause liquefaction in that area. And the other cool thing Sarah's done is, ma is mapped thousands of cracks uh, on imagery throughout Avonside. This is the Avon loop here, and looked at, for instance, relationships of lateral spreading cracks to elevation, to geology, and all that sort of stuff. And basically, I'm going to show this plot only in the sense to say there are other faults. When we look at attenuation, if the fault is there, what sort of shaking will we get in Christchurch? There are other faults throughout the area, including potentially something here, potentially something here, and these sort of things offshore that would would generate ground accelerations in Christchurch above the threshold to cause liquefaction. So going forward, I think the kind of decisions we make now are very important. We shouldn't kind of go, we're out of it, so we can rebuild uh, on the Avon Loop in five years when everyone forgets about it, obviously. Um, 
Do you want to come on up here and go through your questions? So thank you very much for attending. What we do, thought we'd do now is um, Yarg's going to lead a bit of a Q&A period here, and, and I'm just going to s probably stand here and... With, uh, you know, we'll go through some of these questions and uh, they may be some of the things that you're thinking about as well. Um, so what if we could predict earthquakes? We hope we've given you some insights into why this is a real challenge and also what we need to know and what we'd like to know and what is probably going to be very challenging for us going forward to know. Um, the first thing is to remind ourselves that it's very much prediction, deterministic, probabilistic, is the forecasting side. So it's quite a different story depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to come up with better building codes, safer communities, better land use planning, then the probabilistic approach is the global standard and it's the one that we've been using. Um, and at the other end of the scale, if you really want to get into the prediction game and you really want to evacuate people or make people aware of an event that might happen in the next 72 hours, then you're talking about deterministic. So the first thing is you better be sure what, what it is you're asking for, right? Short-term, medium-term, long-term prediction. I'm just going to go through these real quick. Then what do you need to know? Well, we, I think we've kind of gone over that, so I, sh I shan't stress too much more, but if you're going to predict, you need to know not only about the fault system and the stress condition down in the, in the ground, but you also need to learn to start to record the precursors. And that gets back to the comment Mark made at the beginning, throw the money at it, give us the money, I'm sure we can do it, but by crikey, it's going to cost a lot to do it because you can imagine, we can't just set up a little experiment over here and then the next earthquake happens over here. We've missed it. So we've got to cover the whole country, right? So it's, it gets pretty challenging quickly. How realistic is it for us to aspire to earthquake prediction in the next sort of 5, 10, 20, 50, 100 years? Or alternatively... Shall we stick with the probabilistic approach and the forecasting approach, which is what is currently the, the uh, methodology that we bring to the table? So if we were predicting and we, um, we came up with some data that said, you know, we, we think there's going to be something happening over here in the next few days, um, what would you do? As a scientist, what would you do if you felt confident about this prediction? I asked Mark that question, and he said, oh, you answer that one. Um, so, well, what would I do? I'd probably think about this and go, well, who would I tell? I wouldn't go to the press. I wouldn't go to Facebook. I wouldn't go to Twitter. I'd probably go and talk to the minister or my boss and say, what do I do? Who do you, what do you think we should do here? Pass it, pass it on. The, let, let the decision makers deal with this one. What would they do? So let's say I've gone and had a chat to, to um, Minister Brownlee. What would he do? Well, I can tell you, he would almost certainly say, I think we need some peer review of this and see, <laughs> see how good it is. And I'm not kidding, that's the way to do it. You'd want your peers to engage with your work. So we'd all look at Mark's work and say, no, no, no. So, but um, that's, that's the process, right? You wouldn't just go global instantly. You, what you do is you think about carefully what the implications are. And then there's that searching question that as a scientist you grieve over a great deal. What if you got it wrong, right? So you have gone with a prediction. The community's been told. There's been a response from the community, from business. There's probably been an impact in terms of the regional economy. That's usually how these things are sort of assessed. And then you got it wrong. What are the implications? Well, everyone's going to look at you and say, hmm, hmm. But not only that, don't come back with another prediction because we're not going to treat it very seriously. You've just undermined your credibility pretty significantly. OK. I think we probably should go back to that slide. And um, the, last, the last one was, when will we actually be ready to receive anything in the way of earthquake predictions? And really the question is, when are we ready to react rationally and effectively if we are given a prediction? I'm reminded instantly of the photos in the press about a year and a half, two years ago, when there was a tsunami coming. And there's a lovely photo in the press, not a lovely photo, but it was a great photo, 
of a family, including several small children, who went out on the, on the jetty in Littleton Harbour, and then the next part is seeing them running back as the water gets up to the board level. We have to change behaviours, and we have to probably have a community that is able to handle that type of information, understand what it means, and we also probably have to have houses and buildings that we can be pretty clear are going to survive and we're not going to have to rush out. Um, all those things that we've experienced probably come into play in this. So I think it's a good uh, point for me to shut up, probably talk too much. Wendy, we'll hand over to you. Will you join me in thanking uh, Mark and Yarg, please?